first item up is to approve our agenda as presented. Does anybody have any additions or deletions to our agenda for tonight? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve our agenda as presented. So moved. We have a motion and, and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion to approve our consent agenda as presented. So moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to our financial report for March and April. Mr. Ray. Everybody should have in their board packets the March and April financial statements. Um, we're not going to see in these financial statements the results of the current crisis in our revenues. Um, I guess the biggest note, if you look at your March financial statement, page one, your revenues, your sales tax, you see 108 on the last column to the right, you collected $184,000. That's about 40 or $50,000 more than our monthly average. That's December sales. So don't, because the statement is titled March, it's um, a little confusing sometimes. You might think that's a March sales. Um, we're three months in arrears. So your March financial statements represent December actual sales when you go to the store and buy something. Um, so the way it would work is in December, you buy something and charge sales tax. That vendor would remit that sales tax to the state by January 20th. That's when that sales and use tax report is due. State turns around, sends the money back to the county in mid-February. The county processes that, turns around, sends it to the city. City <laughs> processes that, sends it to us. And that's why we're three months behind. Um, and it's always been that way. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. I know there's been a lot in the newspaper about uh, the state sales tax and what's going on with it. We won't know until next month. It won't be reported in your financial statements, but I'll know more about um, March actuals and more importantly, I don't think March is going to be a big deal. I think it's going to, you're going to start seeing it in April. So um, other than that, the financial statements present, I think, fairly and accurately our, our operations for the two-month periods. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Ray? Okay. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve March and April financial reports as presented. So uh, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, Kim, could we have a roll call vote, please? David Queener? Yes. KK Webster? Yes. Tim Bobble? Yes. Merle Price? Yes. Joey Smith? Yes. Curtis Isbell? Yes. Motion carries. Moving on to budget amendment number four. Should I have a memo in the, in the board packet from me? This is a very basic uh, budget amendment. All I am doing, and it deals with one thing, is uh, reclassifying the expenditures for the construction project into another series that more accurately reflects the nature of the expense. Um, there's no new money being spent, no revenues coming in. Um, next month, you will see the kind of the annual adjusting budget amendment to get kind of our books in order. Um, but uh, so uh, this just reclassifies uh, basically our construction expenditures from 70, uh, uh, from 76,100 into 91,300. That's all it is. That'd be my recommendation that you approve that. Okay, we have a recommendation. Any questions or comments regarding budget amendment number four? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve budget amendment number four as presented. We have a motion and we have a second. Any further questions or comments? Kim, could we have a roll call vote, please? David Queener? Yes. KK Webster? Yes. Tim Bobble? Yes. Merle Price? Yes. Joey Smith? Yes. Curtis Isabel? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Thank you. All right, moving on, we have new business. Uh, 
First item up is our salary schedule in Appendix E. If you've had time to, to look at that, that's for the 2020 and 2021 school year. Uh, yeah, yes, if you'll, if you'll just take a look at the um, salary schedules. Um, we were waiting, normally we get our BEP estimates in, in around February and we can start to kind of see what we're gonna be able to do to the salary schedule. This year due to the COVID crisis, we did not get our first BEP estimate until just a few weeks ago. And while at one point we were doing a 4% raise on the BEP portion of the state portion of the raise, um, when the uh, COVID crisis happened, he cut that in half to a 2%. And so we've had to do lots of explaining that that doesn't mean 2% on Clinton City School salary schedule. BEP funds 70% of our positions. And then the 2% is just on the state portion of that 70%. And so um, it's not really, it's kind of inaccurate to say that teachers are gonna get a 2% raise. And so when we looked at our BEP estimates, um, we are getting about $60,000 more this year than we got last year, which is not a significant amount. And when you look, our teachers get raises every year with their step increase. And so that 60,000 was not even enough to cover our step increases. And so um, I've held conversations with all the teachers and we've made such good strides in making um, additional uh, layers into our salary schedule to uh, just show the teachers how much we appreciate what they are doing and the hard work that they're doing and the impact that they are making. Being unsure of how this COVID crisis is gonna impact, um, we know that BEP is gonna not cover our step raises. We also know that, um, that our taxes are expected to go down and we don't exactly know what that is gonna look like. So for the time being, out of an abundance of caution, we are keeping our salary schedule the same as we did um, as we did last year. However, all teachers classified, all employees will be seeing a step increase. So they will be making a little bit more this year than they did last year. And then I'll draw your attention to a special memo that we included at the front of the salary schedule. And this is, our main concern was that if you're tapped out on the salary schedule and you're at the last step, that if we don't layer additional increases onto the salary schedule, then you don't make more the following year. And so we decided that instead of adjusting the salary schedule, what we're gonna implement is a one-time legacy stipend to all of our certified and classified employees who were topped out at the salary schedule. So for, and we did that in line with approximately what the average step increase was on each of the scales. And so certified teachers, if they are tapped out, they will get a one-time $500 stipend. And if they're classified, they'll get a $300 stipend that will just roll into their contract so it won't be a one-time a one-time payment it will just be rolled into their monthly payment so that way we can walk into next year and know that although we weren't able to make significant salary enhancements on the existing salary schedule all of our employees are making a little bit more next year than this year and then um, you know it's mr. Ray and I held this hard conversation and um, all the teachers have been informed of, of what the the salary schedule is going to look like I will tell you that overwhelmingly they were very thankful just to have a position Position given given um, the the current situation but we are prepared that if the for some reason the taxes come in and our projections are not correct and we are able to do something there's nothing to say that we have to adjust the salary at the end of a fiscal year in the beginning of another we can adjust salary schedules at any point during the school year uh, once we kind of see how all of this is gonna play out. So um, before you is a recommendation to approve our salary schedule for the 2020-21 school year, knowing that all employees will make slightly more giving a step increase in the legacy stipend, but there are no current additional layers onto the salary schedule uh, presented at this time. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Ms. Johnson regarding the proposed salary schedule? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve on first and second reading the 2020 and 2021 salary schedule. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? Kim, could we have a roll call vote, please? David Quinn? Yes. Kay Kay yes. Kim Bible? Yes. Motion carries. Moving on to school budget for 2020 and 2021, which is Appendix F. <clears throat> uh, 
everybody should have the second reading of the school budget. Um, when we adjusted our salaries and uh, related taxes for the current situation, that uh, did have a significant change on our budget. Um, so you can see the difference in the memo between the first reading and the second reading. So the, uh, the very first paragraph, which describes the general purpose school fund, we're actually uh, going to budget 2.2% less than the current 2019-20 budget as adjusted and when that adjustment is taking out the effect of the addition and those expenditures from both <coughs> years. If I remove those expenditures from both years and line up the two budgets, this current, the budget proposal is 2.2% less than last year's. Um, and that's really the only change that we made. Um, we looked everything over. Um, I don't think we're impacting our students. Um, we're not having a reduction in force. Um, I think we are not filling one position in a TA position. Um, so that did save us a little bit. But other than that, um, I feel good about the budget, especially given the current situation. Um, I feel like there's a lot of school systems um, that are not having to make, they're having to make some really tough choices, and, and that's people. Um, and I always say, let's make a decision because we want to, not because we have to. Well, a lot of people in your position are having to make those decisions, um, and we are not close to that yet, I think. And that's because you guys have done a great job throughout the years um, keeping us in a good financial position. So any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer. Did we have to cut the TA position, or did something we decided not to fill? They retired. They retired. And we decided, given this, the current situation, um, and, the, and we added a different type of a classroom, actually. So we're actually increasing the number of teachers. Okay. Um, uh, that beha is the behavior classroom. Yeah. So that'll help, you know, offset that okay. loss in a TA position. Um, but uh, yeah, that's it. We're not having a reduction in force. Good deal. Which is the best thing for us. Okay. Any? Further questions for Mr. Ray? Nor who retired. Uh, Debbie Fellers, special ed TA in uh, Ms. Hunt's room. Congratulations to her <laughs> for retiring. <laughs> we're happy for her, but we're sad for us. <laughs> She's awesome. Uh, the federal projects funds budget didn't change. Um, in its hate to say it like this, but it's really not worth getting into the federal projects funds until about October. Um, we know at the end of this year what our carry forward would be money we have over left over this year that can go into next year's budget, and that'll just result in another budget amendment. So I don't spend a lot of time drilling down the federal projects funds. Um, and given the current situation, obviously we're probably going to be allowed to carry forward more money than we have in the past um, just because we've gone several months without a lot of those expenditures however most of those expenditures are salaries and benefits so those still continue um, central cafeteria there's no change from the first read to the second read uh, i laid in uh, a, an increase in airmarks uh, per meal equivalent price i think we we got them at two percent I think we discussed that at the last board meeting. Mm -hmm. And again, um, the budget for cafeteria is really simple with a food service management contract that we have with a fixed meal price. Um, however many meals we sell, that's what we pay. So it's very simple math. Um, there's no salary or benefits to worry about. Um, but um, any other questions? All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve on second reading school budget for the 2020 and 2021 school year. So, so moved. Second. 
We have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? Kim, could we have a roll call vote, please? David Queen. Yes. Kay Kay Lester. Yes. Tim Bobble. Yes. Merle Price. Yes. Joey Smith. Yes. Curtis Isbell. Yes. Motion carries. Scott, I, I would just like to say thank you so much, both you and Kelly and all of Central Office, for the hard work that you do. I know it's not hard when you get to crunching numbers. We've all been through that. But you do a great job in the fact that we are still at full force staffing-wise is is a major feat, and my hat goes off to you. Oh, great job. You. Well appreciate done. Appreciate y'all. I want to add before we move to the next, the next item that one of the ways we were able to keep from rifting people is we got real creative with moving a lot of our, uh, or not a lot, but several of our positions that are funded in GP into the federal funds. And so we, we did a little bit of a shell game, I guess, with some of our employees and where they were paid to try to save positions. So the TA, that's Debbie Fellers that retired at Clinton Elementary, we are not replacing her only because we have got some other ways that we can use TAs and utilize and cover everything that needs to be covered. So it really will not impact um, the intervention groups and the instruction to a great degree. So we were able to absorb that. And then uh, we have done away with a full-time intervention teacher at Clinton Elementary School, and we're using that position to fund the best class, so the alternative behavior class that Jill Turbyville is going to. So, um, so basically, everybody was—I mean, everybody was able to keep their jobs. We weren't have, we did not have to rift any positions to make that happen. And um, so that it's been some heart-wrenching conversations and definitely the hardest one. We're not used to having hard conversations about budgets at Clinton City, but um, time will tell, I guess, with taxes, how all of this plays out. But, but Scott has done a tremendous job. All right, next item up on our uh, new business is our community eligibility program at North Clinton. Kelly, do you have anything on um, that? This is just something that's an annual approval. Um, of course, North Clinton meets the criteria for uh, the community eligibility program, which basically means that all students receive free breakfast and free lunch without having to qualify for direct cert, without having to fill out a free and reduced lunch application. And we've done that for, what, about five, six years, and it has just been very successful at North Clinton, so we want to continue that program. Okay. It is a great program. Does anybody have any questions concerning the community eligibility program at North Clinton? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the community eligibility program at North Clinton. Okay. We have second. a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Moving on, we have our uh, English language arts textbooks adoption, which is Appendix G. Uh, Yes, so um, every six years, of course, we have to look at textbook adoptions for each one of the subjects. So ELA, English Language Arts, was this year. So we have spent this year looking at the different vendors that were approved by the State Department. Um, you probably saw a lot in the media about the, um, the governor's literacy bill that we kind of had some, some issues with some aspects in that where they were going to basically mandate that we had to purchase. Um, a ELA curriculum off of this list. Um, once COVID happened and the legislator shut down and we, they had to use a lot of this money for um, COVID closures and COVID recovery. So that literacy bill as of now has not taken effect. So we are under no criteria at this point to purchase. So just given the fact of where we are, we are really not in any financial shape to uh, do an ELA purchase um, of this magnitude. That's, that's the most expensive purchase that we have, particularly when what we have is yielding results. And so um, we feel like that we have developed a comprehensive ELA program that the teachers are familiar with, that we're seeing good results from kids, and so we're not to the point that we need to fix something that's not broken. So we're going to continue with the ELA program. As you remember, we have purchase that foundations, that foundational skills piece that we felt like was lacking in K and 1. We are expanding that and so we have used some funds this year to purchase that for second grade so that we have a, a specific, a very comprehensive research-based foundational program for K through 2. But other than that, what we did was we did what's called a blanket adoption, which basically means that we adopted everything on the list to where over the next six years, if we feel the need that it is no longer meeting, our curriculum is no longer meeting the rigor of the testing, 
then we have the ability to purchase anything off of that list. So state law says we have to adopt, but we do not have to purchase. Okay. And so we will be adopting just a blanket adoption, or that is our recommendation, and then that will give us the flexibility to purchase anything off that list within the next six years. Okay. Does that mean we have six years to not worry about them forcing something else on you? For ELA, yes. Okay. Not necessarily for another subject area, but for ELA, yes. But now they could come back and revisit the mandate that we purchase the books in the future. This I don't think they will at this at point, this point, just okay. given, yes. And, okay. and our problem with that is what some of the things on the list they were very highly endorsing, but when I looked at other districts, districts that have been using that product for three to four years were performing at a significant lower threshold than what we were. And so it's really, that's a hard, that, that's conversations that I had with the State Department. How do you force us to purchase something when, when, when what we're using is yielding better results than anything that you have on that list? And so, um, so that, that has been kind of pushed aside at this point. We have no indication that that requirement will come back. Okay. Thank goodness. All right, any further questions for Kelly? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to adopt our language arts textbook adoption. So moved. We have a motion, do we have a second and a second? Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, moving on, we'll go to the consolidated application for IDEA and the ESEA, which is Appendix H. So this is just a yearly approval that you do. Uh, we have to do a consolidated application to apply for federal funds. So that is Title I, which is instruction. Title II, which is teacher professional development. Title IV, which is well-rounded activities, which we usually just transfer into our Title I and use it for instruction. And then our IDEA, our special education, and our special ed pre-K. So those are the federal little pots of money that we apply for each year. Um, even though we have made that application, those allocations fluctuate up and down um, as the year goes on. It's kind of a fluid grant. That is why you don't see a specific number on the um, on the uh, approval form, but this is just you all approving that uh, you uh, agree that we can submit that consolidated application and receive those federal funds. Okay. Right. Any questions for Kelly regarding that? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to, uh, to approve the consolidated application as presented in Appendix H. I have a motion, do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries. Moving on, we've got to change our school board policy. This will be on first and second reading for our uh, leave in regards to our uh, current viral crisis, I guess you can say. Yes. So um, those laws have changed a little bit, and I know everybody that has a business here has probably been well informed of those as, as they have changed. Um, but we as a school system have to adopt them as well. Yes, so last month we adopted a couple that got us back in compliance and, and this is just the new federal law about COVID leave and so basically all of our employees have 10 days between now and December um, to where if they feel like that they, they do have it, they've been tested, their waiting results or they do have it or they've got 10 free days that will not be taken out of their sick leave or vacation leave that they can take. But then if uh, there's a qualifying event that if you're taking care of a child because their daycare is closed or because they are sick, you can take additional FMLA at two thirds of your pay. So there's lots of caveats into that, but this TSBA policy um, follows the law to a T and so we need to get that adopted into our policy to protect our employees. Okay, any questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve on first and second reading. Uh, our new school board policy in Appendix I regarding leave. So moved. We have a motion, do we have a second? Second. A motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to reports and information. Uh, our next meeting, barring any change in, uh, <laughs> in uh, shutdowns or lockdowns will be here uh, and that will be June the 11th. 
I have not heard anything at all in regards to uh, rescheduling the Summer Law Institute. I believe it is still on schedule as they have um, presented it. I actually called. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she said it's a right now. They're still It's still on. on. Okay. That'll be in July. I'm really surprised at that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot may change. Yeah. And if, uh, if you have not, Kim, if, if you need uh, anybody, just catch us before we leave. Um, that will be July the 16th through the 18th. Um, and so if you can let uh, Kim know so she can make some reservations before it fills up. Uh, and then our director of schools contract will be uh, in June. And that concludes our information and we'll move on to our director's report. Okay, so you have the director's report in front of you. So there's lots of Clinton City Schools update. It's amazing how schools are closed, but we are busier than ever. Lot, it's a happening place. Lots is go, lot, lot is going on. Um, so this week has been a very busy week. On Monday and Tuesday, um, we staggered our parents by grade levels, and they came and returned their Chromebooks. Um, they picked up an optional summer, summer learning packet, and they picked up their personal school supplies. Teachers bagged those up and had them waiting on their desks for them. And um, we were very eager to see, you know, we implemented this Chrome Home program within 48 hours of school closures. And so while we thought we had our bases covered, we were eager to see, number one, how many Chromebooks came back, and number two, what kind of condition they have come back in. And we've been very, very surprised. I think um, Clinton Elementary might be down to maybe 10 Chromebooks and um, I think North Clinton's down to 14 Chromebooks and so you know we and we've been in contact with those parents and feel confident that we will get those we will get those back um, we've even gone to some houses and picked some up but uh, parents overall been very appreciative of the fact that we got those devices in the hands of kids so that they could participate in online learning and it also gave the kids just a great way to connect with other kids so we found that you know kids were doing Google Meet with other kids in their classroom and it was just a great way for them not to feel so isolated during the quarantine um, but the tech team is going to spend the next few weeks assessing um, if there's been a lot of damage I know that we only had four that to my knowledge right now that were brought back by parents that were damaged um, I will say that one little student um, she got very very creative and did not want to do her iReady lesson and so she decided that she was going to take a um, paper clip and scratch out the um, the camera to the iPad because she knew that if she scratched out the camera it would not read her QR code and it wouldn't let her in iReady. So we got that Chromebook back and they didn't get another Chromebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, but those were very isolated, you know, isolated events when you look at the fact that we sent home probably 900 Chromebooks and we had four return damaged at this point. That is, I mean, I'll take that any day. You know, we may have some more, you know, keyboards that are a key has been picked off or you know a screen has been scratched but to our knowledge there's not been massive damage but the tech team will kind of let us know that as they they get in there and and see if they're if they're all working again so don't no doubt that that contributed to our uh, continuation of instruction plan so the CCS transfer period has begun it started on Tuesday and it will run through the July 15th um, I do want to prepare you we ha we are in the process of denying several different transfers for this year on the basis of behavior attendance and then one particular on parents lack of support and treatment of teachers and um, so um, those parents will be notified within the next week or so that um, their transfer has been revoked. Um, we are continuing to do our daily meal distribution at South Clinton from 12 to 1230. We promised that we would continue that through the end of the school calendar year and so um, Faith Promise has been so faithful every single day to meet us over there and they man that distribution for us and um, we serve anywhere between 60 to 100 meals there each day but when you do breakfast and lunch you're looking at about two you know you're looking at well over 200 meals each day and uh, the parents are just very appreciative of that after the school calendar <coughs> stops we are going to move everything back to North Clinton we've talked to those parents and told them after next Friday because TAs have been coming in and helping us with get everything packed up and ready to ship over since teachers will be off contract we're just going to do it out of North Clinton as long as the federal waiver lasts which right now Scott it goes through June 30th so it's going through June 30th right now we don't know if that will be extended or not um, but um, we've informed all the South Clinton parents and, and the majority of those parents are very willing to drive to, to North Clinton to get that as well. That has just been one of the most beautiful things 
that we have done just to hear the parents' stories of how appreciative they are and um, it just gives us a chance to lay eyes on kids each day and make sure that they're doing good and um, uh, it, it's just it's just good stuff. So we'll continue that until the waiver runs out. Um, all uh, Clinton City Schools principals and central office are now back to work full time. As you know, we did put them on a staggered schedule during the shelter in place, but they are back on a um, full, full contract now. Principals are going to be on contract until June the 5th. And so they are using this time right now. Of course, yesterday and today, they're busy doing kindergarten registration, but uh, they are busy doing cr uh, creating class roles and schedules for next year and writing the school improvement plan and, emer and updating emergency plans. And so they're using this time to just um, get a plethora of stuff done before they leave for the summer. Our Clinton Elementary construction is in full force. And you may have even heard some vibrating um, going on if you live close to Clinton Elementary School because they are busting up rock like crazy. <laughs> in fact, when the teachers came back to, um, to, to collect the Chromebooks that day on the West Wing. I mean, literally the West Wing was just, we were, we were jumping and it was pretty loud. But they're busting up rock. They're in the middle of pouring fitters and foundation and it's a hot mess back there, but there's lots of people working hard. Our parking lot looks great. If you haven't gotten a chance to drive by at night, um, Pat and Johnny and Chris and Matthew, um, our maintenance team worked really hard to do a real pretty wooden fence, but they have put little solar lights on the top. And so at night, it, it's a real dim light, but it just looks, it looks very nice. And so we're excited that that parking lot, <coughs> parking lot is complete. We're um, still scheduled. They're saying right now, August the 7th, which is supposedly the first day of school. I anticipate that it would probably be, I, I don't know whether we'll hit that date or it'll be the following week, but um, that will inhibit our ability to like have classrooms probably open and functioning on the first day of school, but Jenna is um, working on a plan for how she wants to utilize that space for this coming year. Um, I touched base with each one of you yesterday. Um, Bruce Fox with Fox and Farley is going to donate two structures for a free food pantry at North Clinton and South Clinton. Um, we thought those were going to be installed today, but they're actually going to be installed tomorrow. Um, this is where community members um, and churches can keep that stocked with non-perishable items. We've been told that the hygiene items are very popular out of that because EBT cards don't cover toothpaste and toothbrushes and things of that nature. And so those have been really, really hot items that people have been taking from the pantry. Um, but we're going to put one at North Clinton and one at South Clinton, and then Fox and Farley has one in their parking lot that can serve Clinton City or Clinton Elementary students. So that means that our kids and families and community members at all three schools will have access access to that. And he's been putting those up around the around the community. He's he's done some for Anderson County Schools and some throughout the the county. But I just think that's a great way to a great mission field and a great way to support our community during this time, especially when you see the need and the people who've been coming through with our, with our meal distribution. Um, I think that is going to be heavily embraced um, by many of our families. We are also trying to get creative with now that we've got the buildings empty, we want to take care of some much needed maintenance in the school. So I wanted to update you on some of the things that the custodians are working on to improve the aesthetics of our, of our three schools. Um, we have painted the South Clinton gym, and it is absolutely amazing. And I think for the first time ever, we got up in the rafters, and we, well, not we, I had nothing to do with that. Larry and his team um, got up there and dusted um, the rafters, and it just looks so crisp and clean and, and beautiful. So that inspired them to continue painting. And so they're in the process of painting all the entrances to the classrooms and some around the doorways just to give it, to give it a new look, and it looks very nice. It's Scott's favorite color, gray. And um, so uh, <laughs> he doesn't love gray, but we love the gray. It looks very good. Um, then at Clinton Elementary, um, we started this project last year, but sandblasting all of the rails where it had been painted over and over and over again. And so they have sandblasted all the rails back where the tech office is and the, um, the cafeteria, that little um, delivery area and down across central office. They've sandblasted all those. And so we have new bright, shiny um, gray um, rails and they look absolutely wonderful. We are installing um, new marker boards at North Clinton and South Clinton Elementary School. Um, North Clinton, Miss Sheila has gotten into some painting and so she is um, painting the um, 
She's painted all the bathrooms and she's painted the classroom entrances and given that a nice fresh look. It looks wonderful and it is gray <laughs> and um, then also um, the fire marshal we had to replace um, earlier in this year we had to replace four was it four Scott six six, six of the doors outside of South Clinton over time <laughs> the building has settled and when the sun hits the doors they expand and you they're kind of hard to open and so um, the fire marshal had a concern about that so we replaced those six doors and so during these time of school closures it, it, they look amazing they're letting a lot more light in it gives it a more updated look and the other ones really need to be replaced as well even though that was not a fire marshal concern it's not far away from being a fire marshal concern so we are using this time and we're going to go ahead and replace place the remainder of those of those doors during this school closure and then they've already started their deep summer cleaning so they have been working themselves silly and have done just a wonderful job and so when our kids are able to return to school I think there's going to be some noticeable differences in the environment and then I've already told you about Debbie Fellers but I feel like I do need to take time just for those who might be watching to, to just offer a sincere congratulations to her. She is one of our longstanding um, Clinton City Schools employees and has the most dear, precious, just sincere heart. And it's one of those times when she came and told me she was retiring. You want to personally beg her to stay just because you love her so much, but you know it's time for her to enjoy her new chapter in life. So she is gonna be retiring at the end of this contracted year. And um, she's just, if you don't know her, she is an absolute jewel and she will definitely definitely be missed so we want to send a congratulations to her and then on a sad piece of news the COVID closures we have um, canceled um, many of our um, um, enrichment activities that we have during the summer so the exceptional artist camp biz town our stem camp all of those were going to take place in June and we went back and forth and we really wanted to make it happen but we don't want to put kids at risk and so we just decided it was just best if we just cancel those for this year and we'll just reboot that for next year we are still hoping to have some sort of boost camp in July that would run from July 13th through the 24th and it would run kind of like a like a morning summer school from 8 o'clock to 11:30, where um, we would um, we will start with an invitation of our kids that we know did not have internet and did not have the supports to be able to participate in our continuation at home learning program. But then as space allowed, we would continue to open that up to other Clinton City students, but it would be from 8 to 11.30 every day focused on ELA and math. And we're using that federal CARES money, the $150,000 we're getting in federal money for COVID recovery. We would use the funds from that to pay teacher salaries. But then that also gives teachers an opportunity to earn a little bit of extra money as well and then try to close some of the gaps from the extended school closures. All of that, of course, is going to be dependent on what the governor says about how many people we can have together and what social distancing looks like. So we are preparing for that as if it is going to happen, but we probably aren't going to start filling classes and doing invitations until closer to time just to make sure that we're able to pull that off. And then the question of the year is, are we going to start school back in August? And if Kelly Johnson were able to make the decision, it would be yes, 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 we're going to start school back in August. Unfortunately, I won't be able to probably make that decision. It's going to be made for us by the governor and uh, the health department. Um, we are making plans to start school back in August, but we are also making plan B, C, and even D. And so we, are, we, are, we will have a plan in place for if school can open back up in August. We will have a plan if it opens back up in August, but we can't gather in the cafeteria or we can't gather on the playground in massive groups. We will have a plan for that. We are gonna have a plan for if we need to offer some sort of, of blended learning of some kind where uh, we need to offer in person, but then if we've got some at-risk kids that need to do online, what that might look like. And then we're also gonna prepare for what does it look like if August comes and we are totally online. So we're gonna have four different plans that we can put to put in place as soon as we get the word. I honestly don't know that we're gonna have an answer for that until probably July. And so my hope is that we can start I, I know Merle can attest after teaching kindergarten. Can you imagine what it would be like to teach brand new kindergartners virtually? Oh I, I, <laughs> don't, I don't have an answer for that yet. So but we are researching, we are reading, we are we're participating in lots of different trainings and things to, 
to, so we will be prepared for whichever way that that needs to go, but it's gonna be a busy summer for us to prepare, but our goal is to get our babies back in the building and to try to bounce back and recover for, for the instruction that we have lost, but most of all, just to love on them and to make sure that they are okay. But I can't, I can't end without bragging on our remarkable staff and the job that they have done. They have really thought outside the box and have made connections with teachers. They've done drive-by parades. They've put little gifts on kids' mailboxes. They've Zoomed them. They've done, you know, rewards if you've done your schoolwork. We're gonna have a Zoom lunch together. I mean, they have just done some of the most amazing, amazing things, and their heart has just been hurt so desperately. Just they didn't get closure. Kids didn't get closure, so it's certainly not the way that we wanted to end it. But our parents have done, you know, when we did this distribution, we had no idea that if, it, if parents were gonna take us up on the offer to continue um, instruction at home. And I will tell you about 90% of our parents showed up on the dot to pick up distribution folders and had work to return. And the community and the parents took this so seriously. And I know that it has been an additional stress on our parents and our families, but they have embraced it to the fullest extent that their situation would let them. And um, we just, we live in a great place. We're certainly blessed. So that's a little bit about what's happening in Clinton City Schools. Any questions for me? Well, that concludes my report. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. All right, does anybody have any further business to bring before the board? Hearing none, I'll declare this meeting adjourned. <laughs>